All right. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be back in uh, the house of the Lord today. Uh, last Sunday I was preaching in Illinois. And uh, so we praise God for every opportunity we have to preach. And uh, I was sharing with them uh, some of the things that are happening in the world today. And uh, we do praise the Lord that we have the ability to keep up with what's going on around the globe today. And we're excited to report this morning that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Amen. You know, 2,000 years ago, he came just like the prophets said he would. And he came where the prophets said he would come. He lived where the prophets said he would live. He gave his life for us the way the prophets said he would. He was raised from the dead the way the prophets said he would. <laughs> and he ascended back to the Father. And there he is now waiting for this assignment to come back just like the prophets said he would. He is coming back. And we're excited about that. Um, he's actually going to come back and put his feet uh, back in Israel and, and declare himself the king. He is going to be the king of kings. He is going to rule and reign in righteousness for a thousand years from Jerusalem. And we praise God for that. When he steps on the Mount of Olives, I believe the world is going to feel it. The Bible says that the mountain is going to split in two. And it's going to be a massive earthquake probably felt around the world. I, I know this. I know when he returns and actually puts his foot back on the earth. It will be known around the globe that something has happened like never before. He came as a child the first time as a baby and very humbly came. This next time he's going to come with fire in his eyes and declare himself the ruler, the king the Almighty. And we are going to come back with Him. Hallelujah. That's exciting. It's really exciting to study the Word of God and to uh, be able to confirm what has happened in the past so that we can know with certainty what's going to happen in the future. Real exciting. It's faith. It's, we, we, we get our faith from confirmation through the scriptures. Then the Holy Spirit, he comes and lives inside of us, just like Pastor Susie was sharing. And he speaks to us constantly. And we know that we are the children of God because his spirit bears witness with us. The Apostle Paul teaches us that in the book of Romans. Praise God. I want to uh, talk to you again and... Uh, about training up a child and Christmas becomes once again about Christ Jesus coming as a as a baby and as a child raised up and Christmas around the globe has a tendency to Focus on children. And children, of course, they love Christmas because the gifts and uh, all the excitement. We put Christmas lights up 
yesterday at our house, and and uh, the girls were just so excited to see those Christmas lights go up, and uh, they wanted to put the manger out there in the in the yard and get it lit up, and we ended up setting out in the front yard, uh, just looking at the house, you know, uh, the beauty of what we do for Christmas. Christmas is a time where we do a lot of things by tradition, but the world around the globe recognizes this day as a day that a baby was born to bring peace to the world. It's recognized around the globe, whether, uh, you know, with Christmas trees and lights and presents and all this stuff. But the focus is always on the child, Jesus, the gift that God gave to us. It always goes back to that. And those that celebrate Christmas and they don't mention Jesus they're doing something that maybe they don't understand the depth of what they're doing but Christ or the influence of Christ comes into their home the influence of Christ comes into our yards comes into these Christmas lights and these Christmas trees and all this stuff. It's the influence of one person, the man-child, Christ Jesus, coming to the earth. Amen? Keep that in your focus as you prepare to celebrate. Keep that in your focus. I see all this stuff that goes on all these extras as just um, for us an opportunity to shout out even greater. My house, my neighbors know we're celebrating. I don't put up anything for Halloween. I don't put up anything for yeah, whatever. But I, when it comes to Christmas, I want my neighbors to know. I put up this manger scene on my yard. I want my neighbors to know. This house celebrates Christmas and loves Jesus. Amen. Training up a child is something that we're commanded to do. In Proverbs 22 and verse 6, you see it on, your, on the screen and you can read it in your scriptures. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We have been looking at this for a few weeks. In the last two weeks, I've been gone, and um, we had a good trip, by the way, to see Susie's mother. She'll be 89 uh, this next May, uh, April, next April, and... Um, She's a little bit slower, but still about three times quicker than I am, at least. <laughs> she can get down on the floor and back up without crawling over to a couch and pulling herself up. That's pretty good. They laugh at me when I crawl over to the couch, but that's all right. <laughs> they haven't abused themselves like I did. Apparently, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm one of those horses that's uh, a Tennessee term. I've been rode hard and put up wet, <laughs> and that means not taken care of. <laughs> so these aches and pains, I guess I earned them. Some people might call them stripes, stripes for love living. I don't know. I call it stupidity in my youth, <laughs> but uh, whatever. I was working uh, on her sister's uh, 
shed out back of her house and and uh, the lawn people had got into her shed and broke her vinyl siding around the bottom of her shed. So I came up with a little inexpensive way to fix it. And uh, so mixed up some cement and, you know, made, made some little corner protectors around her shed and and uh, that worked out okay but what I realized was getting down there on my hands and knees that moisture in that ground and I guess the cold temperature in that ground I don't know but man that got up in my legs that night and uh, the only way I could solve the problem was to just take it easy on the couch and and have Susie get me everything the rest of the night. <laughs> it seemed to work. I was okay the next day. I guess because she told me, I'm not waiting on you like this again tomorrow. <laughs> so, we're focused back to Jesus as a baby and a child, and once again, to train up a child. We learn from Deuteronomy chapter 6 that we're to train them from morning till bedtime. We learned in Ephesians 6 that we're not to pick on our children. Uh, don't, don't drive them to anger. Don't pick on them. We also learn in Deuteronomy chapter 31 that it's our responsibility to gather in strange children or children that aren't ours and to teach them to love the Lord. We looked at Joshua chapter 8 and talked about the importance of the church in a child's life and our lives. Second Kings, we looked at personal training. Psalm 78 and verse 5, it declares that fathers are primary teachers of children. Children want to be identified by their father. Pastor Susie told you this morning, you know, her own mother, being 88, never knew who her father was. We talked about that on this trip, and I talked to her about it. And this has been a challenge for her entire life. Uh, she never knew who her dad was, and she begged her mother to tell her, but for some reason the pain was so great with her mother that her mother wouldn't tell her. This is a lady that was born again nearly 60 years ago. She's always desired to know, but she doesn't know. Her true father, her birth father, obviously is passed on. And she really has no expectation of ever meeting him or seeing him. But she would like to know maybe who her family is. Her mother married this man and this man raised her. She calls this man her father, or her dad. But there's something down deep in her where she desires to know who her dad was. And her dad, who what family line? What was my name, my family name? Fathers are so important. That's why I believe that God, knowing all things, He's not declared just a spirit. He's declared a father. He's not just declared creator. He's declared father. Jesus wasn't just declared a child. Jesus was declared a man. 
a God-man. Jesus came representing male strength. God represents male strength in creation. And all, all that we discover of God, we see strength and authority and love. Those of us or those of you that struggle with who your dad was, your father, or maybe how he was, give your heart right now completely over to God as your perfect dad. Paul the Apostle, he uses a name or a word, Abba which means daddy. He says, call him Abba Father or daddy. Hey, would you turn on those lights for me up there? They're right behind you. They're to your, right there in the corner. Oh, I knew there was something wrong. I'm up here standing in the dark. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, so we have God as our Father, the perfect Father that will never, ever do anything to hurt you as His child. He brings us back into him and he becomes our daddy through Jesus his son that dies for our sins the next thing we want to see is in Proverbs 3 it says to train your children the importance of learning this is a key thing in raising or training children Hebrews 12 talks about discipline is love that endures. I never saw that scripture the way I see it today. But we have a generation of people today, young people, that don't have the endurance to even live. Many young people today are taking their own lives. They can't endure this life. There's something in this life that is just so difficult for them and they end up wanting out of it and they take their life to get away from this life that they live but discipline is love or builds endurance in children and then proverbs 23 we learn that discipline requires loving determination we went on to talk about living a life of no regrets. That is very much a key in raising our children. Because if we live a life of regret from our childhood, that is gonna affect the way we raise our children. If we look at our childhood and allow our childhood to become the the uh, standard of our life, we might find ourselves raising our children with so many wrong thoughts and attitudes and ideas. You and I, as, as the children of God, we have to accept that we are a new creation. We have to accept that the church is responsible to transform us to help our minds become transformed through the word of God and that as a child of God we are a new person we do not raise our children according to the standards of our childhood we raise our children according to the standards of the word of God amen if you want healthy abundant children raise them in the word of God have the word of truth imparted into your children 
if they weren't imparted into you, we talked about forgiveness, forgiving your parents or your grandparents or whoever helped raise you. But we talked about the importance of coming to a place before the Lord, realizing that he is now your daddy. He is your perfect daddy. And that whatever circumstances you were raised up in, whatever pain and suffering that you might have been exposed to, things that crippled you, things that caused you to believe that you, could, you cannot achieve what you feel in your heart, or that it's just not in you to become what God would have you to be. These are crippling things that come from our childhood. And we must come to a place of forgiveness of our past. I talked to you about forgiving your parents. I told you and shared with you the importance of when I came to a place in my own life that I forgave my parents. I realized that my parents were raised by their parents and their parents were raised by their parents and our family was not Christian. They were not Christians. They, they did not have the influence of the scriptures. They did not have a pastor in their life. Uh, and, and before my parents were saved, my parents were saved when I was a baby. My parents didn't know anything about being a Christian. They learned in the church. But those early years of my life had a big impact on me in, in many wrong ways. My parents were part of a church that was full of legalism and full of all these rules. They didn't understand God as daddy. They understood God as master and uh, that God was out to get them. My father described God to me one time. He said, Jerry, they taught us. We had this idea that we got on first base. We got saved. And God was the pitcher. And if you got off first base like you were trying to lead off to go to second, he was going to try to throw you out. So I was raised in that. I was also raised that... Jesus was going to take care of everything. And my parents had us in church all the time. I mean, <laughs> Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday school, revivals, singings, and whatever else. Uh, the calendar had, was pretty full about church. There's nothing wrong with that. If your children have the opportunity to sleep and prepare for school. But we didn't. We went to school tired so many times. I remembered all through my life when I received my report card and it was so disappointing. And I would make commitments that next, this next report card, I was going to be on my A game. But I was tired all the time from going to church. My parents didn't understand the value of education. They did see the value of Jesus, and I praise God for that. But we're talking about balance today. We're talking about training children to become champions for Christ. Champions in life. A child can be whatever you train it to be. Children are trained. I've always enjoyed my times going to the zoo when I was a boy and they had these monkeys that could ride bicycles and some of those monkeys could ride um, mini bikes and go-karts and they could have a train an elephant to stand up on these uh, these big round things and they could man they could get an elephant to get up there on all four legs standing on this tub like this they had these guys that could train tigers. 
like man-eating type tigers, and trained these tigers to obey them. It was amazing what could be done with animals. And I would just, I couldn't wait to go see the monkeys. The monkeys, if I go to the Jacksonville Zoo, I want to go see the monkeys. Monkeys are amazing. But you can train a monkey to do a lot of things. You can train a lot of animals to do a lot of things. But we live in a world where you can't train children. What's up with that? What is up with that? The Bible says we can, and the Bible says that we must. We must train them up in the way they should go. It's important for us to learn from others. You'll see in your handout today, I just, I, I left you some, some uh, topic lines. To learn from others. We are smart to pay attention, to watch other people. Look for clues about how to raise children better. Study families. When you see a family that seems to have things going on pretty well, pay attention to what they're doing. Try to find out what they're doing. They might be doing something that you're not doing. Something that is critical in how your child will respond and how your child will end up. If you want your child to be like you, Just raise them like you. Maybe the way you are is just right. Maybe you've learned and gained enough knowledge and understanding and enough wisdom on your own. But the important thing here to recognize is that we are granted by God an intelligence to look and observe and learn. God designed us like that. I pay attention to people all the time. I pick up things, good things. I, I see things in people and I think, you know, that's smart. I need to do that. I need to add that into my life. I see other things that I quickly see in people and the way they operate. And I quickly know that that is the wrong path to go down because I can see the destruction in their own lives and maybe in their own children. If people come up to you and compliment you and say that you're a good parent, there's a good chance that you're on the right track. They're seeing something in you and they're looking at your children and their children are complimenting you. Your children are a reward to you. If you are around people and you see them trying to get away from you because of the way you are with your children, pay attention to that. What is causing people to want to get away from me or get away from my family? What's going on in this picture? Look at balanced children. We have some school teachers in the house here. They can get up and tell you a lot about children and about balanced children and about the joy of balanced children. Do you know that children can be out of whack on the good end and out of whack on the, the bad end? Do you know that? Do you know that a child can be just so full of themselves on the good end that they're just obnoxious and uh, they, they know it all and you know you've put so much training into them they have learned so much and they want to let everybody know how much they know they're out of balance there's a time for that and we should talk to our children about th things like that but then there's also children that are on the other end of the scale that are just so unruly and out of balance that we want to get away from them as well. 
Sometimes we meet a child that is kind and is at peace. And we all know what that feels like. We want to give that child a hug, don't we? Huh? We like to be around those children that are kind and gentle. While we're thinking about children and learning from others, we also need to constantly be reminded that children are different sizes and different ages. And babies are babies and toddlers are toddlers and grade schoolers are grade schoolers and teenagers are teenagers and they're different. And we need to respond and live with them at their particular age. And we need to learn how to raise them up in that age bracket. The next thing I want to talk about is quality time. This is a big subject for me. With Zoe and Gracie today living in our home, I, uh, I just, I don't know, it just does something for me. Quality time. I see those girls and I see the, the value of their future. And I intentionally do things. We have a lot of different times at our house. Play time, work time. Not a whole lot of work time with those little ones yet, but it's getting more and more. They're talking to me about work. Papa, what can I do to work? Their friends at school are talking about work. Their little chores that they have. Papa, do you have some chores for me? Children want to help. They want to be part of the family. I'm always talking to them about family. We're family. One of them the other day responded to me or talked to me or let me know that, Papa, we're family. I want that to be built into them. Family. Purpose. We are this family. This is who we are. That We do things because we're family and we're close and we look after each other. We're tight. I want them to grow up and be tight with me. Be tight with Nana. Be tight with Corey. I want them to be tight. I want Zoe to be tight with Gracie and Gracie to be tight with Zoe. We're family. We look out for each other. We care for each other. We have a purpose on this life and God put us in this family so that we could be a blessing to the family of God, to the big family. We have discipline time as well. Ah, that's usually not a good time, but it's there. And then prayer time. Prayer time. Zoe or Gracie is the one to remind us quickly about prayer time. If we take a bite of food or, or eat, uh, eat something and we haven't prayed over our food, Gracie's going to say, we didn't pray. She knows about prayer time. There's something else that I've learned that they really love. And that is a little game that we play. I remember time. Where we tell them stories. And those little girls, they'll want to they'll hear those stories, the same story, over and over and over. About something that happened. And we tell them, I remember when you were two. And this happened. One time, one of them got sick. And they got a heavy fever. And uh, I made the decision, I don't know how this happened, but it just did. But Papa said, go get some cold or wet, wet washcloths and wet towels and put on that baby and cool that baby's body down. Nana reminded them of that when they, they were, when you were little, Papa did this. They liked to hear that story. 
They like to hear the stories of when something happened in their life. And it's called Remember Time. Reminding them of how they were loved and taken care of. It's important for them to live in their life and to have these thoughts in them and to, to go through life knowing they have stories about being cared for, being watched out at, over and loved. And then I want to talk to you about protecting your children, or now I want to talk about it. This is key. You ever have your child or see a child that goes off to their friend's house and they come back two hours later and you have to reprogram your child? That's because we live in a spirit world. And there's spirits even on children. There's spirits in homes. You can send your child or allow your child to go to someone's home and they'll come back to, to your home and you'll have to immediately begin this reprogramming. Because they, they're going into a spiritual realm that is not healthy, not holy. You're raising them in a healthy place, in a holy place, and then you, you allow them to go off over here to this little girl's house or little boy's house, and they come back. Or maybe their cousin's house. Protecting your children is a big deal. What they see, hear, and experience affects their life, affects their training. You're not the only person training your child. They're being trained everywhere. They're trained in Walmart. They're trained on television. They're trained at school. They're trained by their friends. I see people raise their children, and I was raised like this, where there was a, a lot of structure in my childhood and a lot of discipline. But when I turned, I don't know, 13 or 14, for some reason, my father had this idea that I had to be a boy and go out and experience some things. They allowed my sister and I to hang out with my mother's youngest sister. That was a disaster. We looked up to her. She was young enough to where we could relate to her, but we looked up to her and thought she was cool. She was contaminated. She was bad news. She influenced us in ways that caused me to make a lot of mistakes. Family members might be unsafe. Your sisters and brothers, children, or family, your sister and brother, maybe they, in their marriage, they allow things in their home that your, ch your child does not need. I don't care how bad they want your child to come and spend the night. If it affects your child to go to another person's home, and your child has to come back, and you have to retrain that child, you're better to keep your child at home and help your child understand more about the value of your home and your family than become part of somebody else's. A child can go to another person's home and be influenced so bad or so deeply that it will trigger in them thoughts that will come back in later years. It will trigger in them ideas that will come back up in them and cause them to be rebellious. It will trigger them. They'll see this other child being able to get away with whatever and they'll come back home mad. They'll come back into your home angry. They'll be angry at you. 
They'll say, well, why, why, can't, why can't I? Little Johnny and little Susie, they, they get to do it. Why can't I? Pay attention to who your children are hanging with. Do not allow someone else to train your child. Amen? It's vital. Is your home a safe place? Are you paying attention to your children? Are they changing? Are, is your child becoming insecure? Today we have um, a humanity factor that says, give a child what they want to keep them quiet. This is one of the, the things that we've been programmed Give them what they want so that they'll be quiet or they'll behave. What they do or what that does to them, that puts them in charge. If your child is angry or you see a child that is angry, that child has way too much responsibility. When a child is spoiled, they are given responsibility that they're not old enough to enjoy or to respect. When you see an angry child, they're in charge and they're not mature enough to be in that position and they're frustrated, they're about ready to pull their own hair out while you're screaming, you're about to cause me to pull my hair out. They are so frustrated because you've got them in a position of responsibility that they're not equipped to handle. When you see an angry person, an angry adult, or a person that, that struggles with anger as an adult, that child or that person is insecure. Anytime, you listen to this, and you write this down as a quote from Pastor Jerry. Anytime that you experience a person that is trying to control everything, you're looking at a person that is insecure. You're looking at a person that wasn't raised right. You're looking at a person that doesn't know who they are, and so they try to control as many things as possible. People that are super controllers or mega controllers, whatever you want to call, call it, they're dangerous. Get away from them. Do not allow them to influence you. If you're a controller, accept the truth today. Something was trained in you that needs fixed, needs repaired, needs God. We're not put in this life as the children of God to control. We're put in it to love. Amen? We are to love. And we are to take care of each other. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't control or uh, guide life in certain ways. What I mean by control, I mean by these people that are trying to control everything. They're so uncomfortable with who they are. That's what they understand. And if they can control everything, they try to, they're trying to hold everything into their realm of understanding. Is this helping you? This is good stuff. Is your home a safe place? Are you safe in the way you speak, in your actions, and your emotions? Are you building your child, training them, or harming them? We had a little saying when I was a kid, sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt me. That is the biggest nonsense 
lie that ever came down the pipe. Names do hurt me. Words hurt me. Sticks and stones can break your bones, that's for sure. But words will cause you to have pain so deep that it might take you a lifetime or an opportunity to come and hear the truth to be set free. We are to look for signs of health and balance in our children. I was at uh, Rusty's Orphanage there in Haiti last month. And Haiti doesn't give any money to orphanages, but they want to come and look at your orphanage and inspect it. And they came and looked at the orphanage, and the director of the orphanage was talking to me about it. And there's many things that need repaired at the orphanage. And he's trying to talk to the orphanage guy or the inspector about, yeah, we're fixing this and we're fixing that. And the orphanage inspector finally stopped him and said, I'm really not here too much concerned about the facility as much as I'm concerned about are the children happy and healthy? Are they smiling? Are, are the children at peace? And he said, these children here are happy. On Friday night, they have all 50 of the children come together downstairs in this one big room. And these children entertain each other with structure for two or three hours. They'll sing songs and they'll do this and they'll dance and they'll all kinds of things. But they'll laugh back and forth at each other. They're happy. They're excited. And they're safe. I want the communion to be handed out, please. I want to talk about discipline as they're handing out communion. We talked about this some um, a few weeks ago. The Bible says much about discipline. Here is the key to godly discipline. The key is to keep your emotions under the authority of Christ. Maybe it would help you before you correct your children to remember the compassion that God had for you and the salvation that came to you. But godly discipline needs to be done something similar to this. And that is, if your child does something wrong or your child's accused of something, Look into the offense. What is the accusation? There were times in my life, my father allowed me to explain why I did what I did. And he saw my side. And he responded in that effort. There were other times I was caught right in the crosshairs and I was guilty. And my father would take us to court, so to speak. And of course, he was the judge. And he was the one that would either hand out the punishment or give a reprieve. Well, my father would punish us There were different punishments for different things. He had a scale, a grading scale. He never just grabbed you up and started beating the dust out of your pants or whipping on you. My father did spank us. I have no scars, emotional scars from any spanking I ever received from my father or my mother. My scars are always 
I look back in there from my rebellion. But when my father would discipline me, I would be in my room. He would send me to my room after the discipline. And I would be down there trying to tie my clothes onto the stick, you know, so I can crawl out the window and run away from home. You've seen that picture, right? I was, I was down there. All my, my, my emotions were just going nuts. My britches were hot. But my emotions were going nuts. I, you know, I, I didn't like that experience that I just received. I didn't like it. And the rebellion in me was fighting against that. But about 10 or 15 minutes later, a gentle knock would come on my bedroom door. And my father would come in and sit down on my bed and say, Hey, buddy, how you doing? Hey, buddy, I just wanted to come check on you. How you doing? He was my father, but he was my buddy. I was his buddy. He cared about me. My father didn't do everything right. I tried to explain that, and I forgave him. I went through a process of forgiving my parents. I didn't go tell them, I forgive you for this or that. I didn't say anything to them. I just, in my heart, I forgave them. You must do that. Today we're taking communion and we're reminded once again how Jesus came and he took all of our sins on himself. And he did all the suffering and he, he took the penalty because his father in heaven asked him to come and set him free. Give them an opportunity to become healed, their emotions to be healed. Give them an opportunity to, to see that they can be forgiven. When my dad would come and sit on the bed and say, hey, buddy, how you doing? And I look back and I can see the value of being forgiven. Being forgiven. If you were raised where your parents slapped you with their open hand and yelled and screamed at you, I'm sorry that that happened. I really am. I've talked to too many of you that are trying to get over it. You're trying to get over your childhood. And you're struggling with it. Your Heavenly Father, He's never going to openly slap you. He's not going to demeanor you. The devil wants to demeanor you. He wants to tell you you're no good. But your Father in heaven, He's speaking to you through the Holy Spirit and He's saying you have value. You have value. You're mine. You belong to me. Thank you for being my child. That's what He speaks to us. He loves us and he wants us in your life today as we take this piece of bread Jesus told us to remember him the suffering in his body a lot of that stuff the suffering in his body we can relate to in our childhood or we can relate to how people try to treat us there's a lot of people that we have met in our lives that are so messed up they get around us and they if we, if we try to get too close to them that mess will start getting on us we'll begin to take on 
their troubles. That isn't the way it is. We're not to take on their troubles. We're to help them bring their troubles to the same place we brought ours. And that's to Jesus. Amen. He says, take a piece of bread. It's kind of a simple thing, isn't it? You have a piece of bread there? And he said, take that piece of bread. And he said, every time you do it, remember my body broken for you. Well, we know through the scriptures that he was spit on. They lied about him, pulled his hair out, beat him unmercifully, nearly killed him. They said, the Bible says he was unrecognizable. He did that for us. We're talking about God in a man that could have said, no deal. It's not happening today. And he could have destroyed everyone just by speaking. But he honored his father. Our father wants us to be healed. Amen. Are you willing to be healed today? Will you join with me right now and just take this piece of bread and hold it up to the Lord and let's pray together. Are you willing to be healed? Are you willing to let it go? Are you willing to let your past go? Are you willing to say today, Father, you're my daddy. Heavenly Father, you're my daddy. Lord, we hold up this bread and we acknowledge that you came so that we could be set free and that you suffered in your body so that we can come together and be set free. We can declare in your name that you came to obey your father and now he is our father. And we take this bread in your name and we declare we are healed our emotions are healed in Jesus name take and eat as you're chewing on that enjoy it person. I'm a new creation. My Father in heaven loves me. He loves me. I'm a new person. I have a new life. My emotions. Oh, I give them to you, Jesus. I give you my emotions. I bring them to you. I accept that I'm healed in your name. I accept that my body is healed through your power. I accept that my future is before me because of what you did for me. How wonderful. Are you with me? Huh? Doesn't that just make you just want to smile? Just, wow. Wow. He says, take the cup and remember my blood shed for you. God said without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And he would only accept the blood of his son for the sins of all humanity, past, present, and future. We had sin. We have sin. And we will have sin. The church is helping us, equipping us, 
teaching us and training us so that we'll have less sin, less rebellion against the Lord. But the blood of Jesus is for all sin. All sin covered in one offering. All sin covered in one time where he hung on the cross. His blood ran to the ground and his body died for us. He became the sacrifice, the spotless lamb. Bless his holy name. Would you hold up your cup with me? Let's just say a prayer together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying in my place, for taking my sins and suffering so that I could be forgiven. I received the forgiveness of all my sin, past, present, and future. And I declare, Lord Jesus, your blood shed for me is all I will ever need. In Jesus' name, take and drink. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus did you receive the word of god today wasn't it good we're going to talk about it some more next week this is great. I never had a pastor teach me these things. Maybe I was just in the wrong church, I guess. I don't know. But I just never did. But I've learned a lot through serving the Lord. I've learned a lot through studying the Word of God. And I've learned a lot with children. I watch children all the time. I get excited when I see children with life in their face and their eyes lit up. And I see a healthy child. Their emotions are under authority and their life is full of the love of God. We have a bunch of them here in this house exciting exciting to see them and to be with them amen if you've got friends and you do that has children and you do go get them bring them here let's help them amen let's love them and let's look for some children that we can help to transform. Amen? As your friends are transformed, their children will be transformed. Let's go get them. Would you raise your hand for the blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord's countenance come upon you and give you his peace. May this word today that we were fed from the Word of God become a meal that will cause us to grow and to become what our Father in Heaven would want us to be. 
May we raise our children and our grandchildren and our children of our neighbors and our children everywhere where we see children, the value in them. And we become a part of the value of Jesus Christ in the children's lives that we meet and that we have and that we know. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Go tell someone about Jesus. And listen to me real quick. Listen to me. Wednesday night. Wednesday night. I'm going to give a prophecy update. Huh? What? Oh, this Wednesday. Okay, I'm, thank you, Corey. Well, be the next Wednesday then. Okay, this Wednesday night, we're going to, Raphael and Tina are going to uh, have the, their vows recommitted to each other, their 50th anniversary. And so come together for us with that. And I, I want to give you one quick word of prophecy, uh, of end, uh, end time prophecy, really quick. Yesterday, it was reported, it first came out on the Fox News, and then it vanished. I can't find it anywhere on the news. But it's, it's in Israeli news. And I got up in the middle of the night, uh, Saturday morning, I guess that would be. And I checked on the news. And Israel bombed Iran right outside of Damascus. The, the article says that they shot uh, several rockets, bombs, towards where Iran is building a military base. Two weeks ago or so, Russia made a declaration. They met with Turkey, Iran, and Russia met together. And Russia has declared that Iran has the right and that they will back Iran against any attack that comes against them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you're visiting today, I want to encourage you to look for the return of Jesus. The rapture of the church, I believe, is soon, very, very soon, maybe today. That's what I always say. And I say, if it's not today, it'll be on Tuesday. That's a joke here at New Beginnings. But things are changing in the Middle East. The Middle East and Israel specifically is the key to the return of Jesus back to this earth. The prophecies are declaring that these things are going to happen and they're in the beginning stages of happening. The war of Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38 and 39, and Isaiah 17 and verse 1, the sudden destruction of Damascus annihilation of Damascus where it's going to be uninhabitable. Damascus is an ancient city that is big. But the Bible prophesies Damascus is going to be utterly destroyed. Damascus is setting on the largest cache of chemical weapons in the entire world. Damascus is in the scriptures. The scriptures are there for us. And we are able to read and to see and to help us know the, the time that we are living. Are you with me? When I asked you to go and tell someone about Jesus, it might be the last time. We're, our opportunities are running out. Go tell someone about Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. I love you. We're not afraid. We're alive in Christ.